GWAMIT is um, a campus-wide student group uh, that aims to develop uh, graduate women's personal and professional um, uh, and professional side. Uh, this conference is one of our three flagship programs. One is uh, the fall uh, leadership conference, the other one is this one, the spring empowerment conference, and the third one is the mentorship program. Uh, please try to find out more about us and feel free to sign up. We have great events and it's great to all be together and organize these events. Uh, we have many things to gain from them. So today uh, we are happy to, to host uh, Michelle Suda. Uh, she is founder and president of Word Power and Communications and Cambridge Communications. And she will give us the secrets about how to communicate to establish credibility and authority. Please join me at welcoming Michelle. Can you hear me? Can everyone hear me well enough? OK, good. Um, thank you for having me here. Thank you, Yola and others, for arranging things so that I could be here. And I'm very delighted to be here uh, because the subject of communication has obsessed me for years and years. And the subject of communication for women is something that is very important to me and very close to my heart. So. I'm going to tell you as much as I can squeeze in to, we're starting a little later, obviously, and I know you want to maintain some time at the end for Q&A, so I'm going to try to squeeze in as much as possible. Um, we actually have a bit more time. Oh, you do? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before I start and say any more about myself, it, it just so happens that one of the biggest and best female communicators of the era has died, died yesterday. Do you know who that is? Margaret Thatcher. Margaret Thatcher, right. Now, I must say to you that I didn't agree with her politics, but she was a terrific communicator. And um, I just thought this was an interesting tie-in. One of the things about Margaret Thatcher is that she got a lot done. And her criticism of many people, and especially women, was that they didn't get a lot done for the following reason. This is a quote from her, all right? If you set out to be liked, you won't be prepared to compromise. You would be prepared to compromise on anything at any time, and you would achieve nothing. Now, the key, the key term here is setting out to be liked. I think, and I know this from my own experience, that as we attempt to become more and greater authority figures, that is establishing credibility and maintaining it, it is sometimes at odds with how we feel about being liked, all right? And sometimes it, you're feeling like you're shuttling back and forth. I'll talk about that more later, but I thought it was good to have a quote from her. Um, I'm going to use another quote from her, but I have to apologize to the man in the audience. There is one brave, brave soul. <laughs> who, of course, represents all men everywhere, <laughs> all right? Margaret Thatcher said, in politics, if you want anything said, ask a man. If you want anything done, ask a woman, OK? She also claimed that the reason England lost the 13 colonies, you know, how do they lose them? She said, it wouldn't have happened if a woman had been prime minister. Now, that's gutsy, all right? As I said to you, I, I don't necessarily like her, and I certainly don't agree with her politics or didn't, but it's terrific to see that somebody really made it into the top tier of, of government, and that that was a huge first, not only in her country, but it was a good sort of incitement to other people in other countries. So thank you, Yola, for the introduction. I'm going to tell you one more thing or ask you one more thing. How many of you, if you can recall, I don't know how long you've been at MIT, but how many of you can remember what it was like to be accepted to MIT? Anybody? Okay. 
Now, I assume that it was a good feeling. Yes? I mean, nobody got depressed about it. Right. It's a good feeling. Why? Is it because you perceive MIT as being one of the primo institutions in not only the United States, but the world? Raise your hand. Do you associate MIT with the best and the brightest? Okay. Now, how many of you looking at yourselves feel like you are the best and the brightest? That's two people. Anybody else? All right. <laughs> well, you, you see there's a law of transitivity here, and there's like a little a break in the chain. If you're at MIT and it brings it into the organization, the academics, the best and the brightest, that must mean you. And so I want you to keep that in mind as I talk to you about establishing and maintaining credibility. Because going forward, you must remember that wherever you are, you will always have a halo around your head. And that's the MIT halo, right? Now, the only place that the MIT halo doesn't shine a lot is where? Harvard. Well, it's true at Harvard. It, 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 it doesn't. Well, you know, actually, if you look at Harvard and MIT, Harvard's the other place in Cambridge. You know, it's up the street. If you, if you think about Harvard and MIT, who else do they really respect but each other? I mean, think about that. Maybe they respect Yale or, but there are like five organizations, five academies that pretty much respect each other, even though they're rivals. No, um, where does your halo not shine the brightest? where there are other halos, right? Here. 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 You're the best and the brightest. You are among the best and the brightest. And many of the best and the brightest here are senior to you. Yes? They're more experienced. They've been here a long time. And so what you're doing is trying to strike a balance between being confident, knowing who you are and what you've done, and also being aware that you're not at the top of the profession you may want to be in, but you are well on your way, all right? So as Yola told you, I'm the founder and president of Word Power Communications and Cambridge Communications. Uh, in a nutshell, for 25 plus years through Word Power, I have been conducting training and development for all kinds of professionals everywhere, all right? And in just about every kind of profession you can imagine. Uh, there is health care. There's every kind of corporation. There is investment, banking, t high technology, everything. And I'm telling you this for a reason. I can tell you one thing that's true about all of those places. And that is that there is no one right way to communicate. No one right way to communicate. Because what it takes to establish and maintain credibility at the Federal Reserve Bank, right? This is an extreme, right? The Federal Reserve Bank, a cautious institution, a conservative institution. Another client of mine is Reebok. OK, that's the other end of the spectrum. So what it, what it takes to, main, to establish and maintain credibility here is very different from what it takes to do the same there. So the message I'm going to continue to give you throughout the day is it's relative, but you can strategize how to be with respect to each different organization you're with. Cambridge Communications grew out of word power because so many people came up and said to me, we've heard about the courses you do in, within organizations, but what if our, my organization doesn't offer the courses or doesn't develop us? Can we take the course? And historically, I would have to say no. Um, I'm sorry, you can't. Now I can say yes. All right. Cambridge Communications is the same as Word Power, the same courses, but now they are offered on an open enrollment basis. So that's the only difference. So I'm going to use your lingo here for a second. Uh, the lab and the field. This is my lab and field, right? I was at Harvard. Don't hold that against me. <laughs> and occasionally, I'm back at Harvard to teach special programs. 
but I was at Harvard on the full-time faculty for seven years and now go back to teach special programs. As important, I think, to you, given engineer, the engineering uh, emphasis at Northeastern, is that I was one of the two people who founded the business and technical communication program there that exists to this day, which means that I have had the privilege of working with a gazillion uh, kinds of engineers and have really enjoyed it. So as I said, I've run the gamut through all kinds of organizations, corporations, banking and investment. And the lesson here is that it's important to establish credibility everywhere, but the way you do it from one place to another and within academia is very different. I am going to talk about communication today, but I'm going to talk about how an orchestra is made. Right? Any musicians in the room? OK. I don't know if you've had this experience, but let me give you the history. Historically, orchestras were comprised or are comprised of musicians. But historically, they have many, many, many more male musicians than they have had female musicians. And also historically, they've had many more Caucasian male musicians than they have had non-Caucasian male musicians. So there was a couple of decades ago, I wouldn't call it an uprising, but a questioning of the audition process. And a number of people got together and said, hey, let's make it blind. You know what I mean by making it blind? I don't think the conductor should be able to see the musician who's playing, nor should the rest of the uh, decision makers. So what they did, of course, the conductors and the others thought it wouldn't make any difference. But they allowed them to put up a screen. And so what happened then was that if you were a violinist, you would walk in the door, but main you'd be behind the screen. You take out your instrument and play. You didn't even have a name that was announced. It was a number, all right? So guess what happened after all of these numbers behind a screen had auditioned? Huge numbers of women. Huge numbers of non-Caucasian men and women, all right? Because it was blind. One of the... Uh, most important quotes I can give you from this. And by the way, I've taken this from Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink. Are you all familiar with Blink? Are you familiar with The Tipping Point? OK. And, and the latest one is called Outliers. But Blink is really, really important because it's how people assess each other and other things and make decisions in milliseconds. A veteran musician said this. I'm going to read it aloud and emphasize it because it really does capture what had happened before. Some people, musicians, look like they sound better than they actually sound because they look confident and have good posture. Other people look awful when they play but sound great. Other people have that belabored look when they play, but you can't hear it in the sound. There is always this dissonance between what you see and what you hear. And the audition begins the first second the person is in view. It shouldn't be the case, but it's true. And there are all kinds of cliches that undermine that, uh, the biggest one being you can't judge a book by its cover, right? The truth is we all judge books by their covers, or we think we can. And even if we're not right about it, we've already made a judgment. Every time you and I stand up to present, uh-oh, we have a crash here. I'll continue to talk. Let's see. All right, while, while the high technology people are working on this, um, let me just ask you something. How many of you were aware that auditions for musicians involve being seen, right? And were you aware that the change had been made to, to auditioning behind a screen? Universally? Well, some people haven't yet accepted it, but they're wrong. <laughs> 
But you see how it yields something that's very important. You've eliminated every other factor except the factor, right, of the music itself. The reinforcements. Okay, let me keep talking. Is it, is it up there? We need you. Yeah. Okay. Every time we present, we'll walk into a room. Unless we're preceded by a big reputation, like having won a Nobel Prize or being um, a senior faculty person at MIT, we are auditioning in a sense for each audience. I am auditioning for you. The problem is that we have no screen to stand behind. Thank you. No screen we can stand behind. Now, we have, we have done two things, actually. We have written the music already. That is, you've done the work, right? You've amassed the content. You've worked your way through it. You've got the message. But now you have to be the musician who plays it. And again, we can't be behind that screen. So we need to control the elements that go into people making snap decisions about us. All right? At the audition, the first seconds, and I should amend that to say the first milliseconds, because after all the studies have been done, uh, the sad truth is that people judge in a matter of milliseconds. And once they make a judgment, it, it takes a great deal to separate them from that judgment. So you walk in, and fair or unfair, here's what gets judged. Your posture, your dress, the, the way you're wearing your hair, your facial expression, and the variety of expressions, the degree to which you can make eye contact with people, and believe it or not, something as simple as, and seemingly unimportant as, how you transport your materials. This is terrible, but it's true. And instead of feeling vulnerable about this, I suggest we feel in some ways empowered by it. If we can be proactive, we can use these elements to our advantage, but we have to be really mindful of making strategic decisions in all of those areas. And the other thing you have to do is Plato, know thyself, all right? You've got to know what you look like and how you animate yourself when you walk in a room and then when you begin to communicate. So I suggest to you again, it's all about credibility, establishing it, maintaining it. The way to do it is the following. The elements I just covered, dress, posture, et cetera, et cetera, plus everything else in a presentation must be controlled by you. It doesn't take much to control, but it does take an explicit decision to do that. It's a fast decision. You have ideas, concepts, et cetera. You like them. How can you get other people to like them and be impressed by them? So instead of simply telling them about your ideas, you want to romance those ideas for your listener. Does everybody know what I mean by romance? I'm not, or whatever. I'm talking about you have to impart to your listener the kind of magic, so to speak, that you feel for whatever it is you're talking about so that they experience it. This is not about knowledge. It's about feeling. There are a number of things that have to be done. Don't try to do them at once, and don't try to do them randomly. They should be done in a particular order, separately, hence the divide and conquer. And the reason for the particular order is that there is such a thing as a domino effect. We all know what that is, right? Uh, people line up all sorts of dominoes to fall into all kinds of patterns. Uh, I don't know why they do this, but they do it. It takes a lot of patience, and I don't know what people get out of it, but let's be fair. The whole, the whole picture doesn't come into being until the first domino goes down, which affects the second and the third, and so on. All right? What is the domino effect in presenting? Domino effect is preparation. 
It is not fair for you to judge yourself as a presenter, especially your delivery skills, until you have given yourself every advantage through preparation. Now, preparation doesn't mean it takes a long time. It just means that it's done. And it's, again, done very consciously. So you should be so well prepared when you're up in front of a group that you need to remember nothing. Now, you won't forget your expertise. But you don't need to remember, what was I going to say? And when was I going to say it? And I promise you that the energy that you would have used thinking about what you were going to say and what comes next will now be liberated and will naturally go into your delivery skills. Right? The energy has to go somewhere. It goes into your delivery skills. It goes into your gesture, your posture, and very important, the animation of your voice. So let me take a look to show you, actually, what the plan is today. First, identify your main communication goal. And we'll do that in a second, right? Know why your communication skills are essential in reaching that goal. In other words, communication skills, or the goal of good communication, is the same as the goal of your professional know-how. They're together. And the only way anyone listening to you really knows how smart you are, how hard you work, is how it gets communicated to them. And you and I judge all the time people who don't communicate well and assume that because the communication isn't good, it may be that the thinking is not as good or as clear. So we need to really accept that and, again, do something about it. There are several decisions to make. We need to know what they are and strategize them quickly, but explicitly and strategically. The ordering matters. And unfortunately, or fortunately, even the most superficial aspects of delivery count. They're important, and sometimes they're too important and override the importance of what it is that you know. So I'm going to be spending the next, let's see, are we, we're staying here till 6.30, right? Uh, I'm going to spend the next, uh, up until 6.15, <laughs> I can't calculate that quickly. Uh, up until 6.15, I am going to talk about the strategies and decisions that you make as a communicator. But I want to leave time for a Q&A so that as you listen, if you please will write down any questions or comments that you have about anything that I'm saying. Please record them so that you don't forget them, and please raise them when we do the Q&A. OK? OK. Your main goal, as I said, is always credibility. But how to establish it will change when the audience changes. And here's a, a somewhat of an irony. Establishing credibility means we think the conveyance of knowledge, and it does. But there are times when the degree of your knowledge, the breadth of it, and the depth of it can actually be a disadvantage. A disadvantage. And I'll tell you why. Because every time you and I try to communicate about something that we know or know well, all right, you know everything there is to know about x. Topic X, right? You're up in front of a group to talk. You are now bombarded by everything you know about topic X, right? It's all coming at you. Therefore, you have to spend so much energy managing that. You know too much. We know too much as presenters because by the time you're presenting, you've obviously mastered some kind of information, some body of information. So you need an intervention. And that's what. This program I'm going to be talking to you about is delivery. Why is it important? Because ultimately, that's all people see and hear in the moment, right? You're going to get judged by your delivery. But it isn't fair, as I said earlier, until you do everything you can to drive that delivery and ideally drive it up through preparation. So that's what this is all about. I'm going to talk to you about the four decisions that you, you and I must make consciously and strategically and even quickly before we get into the room right, and start to talk. 
right? You've got to put yourself in the audience's position. They're not you. They don't know as much as you know. They don't care necessarily about what you know, right? So if you think about that, you've already made a huge change in your relationship to the material, right? How much do they want to know about topic X? And here's the really important question. How much do they not want or need to know? Okay? If you ask yourself that question, you are automatically going to delete a lot of information that is true about topic X, but does not need to be conveyed. You just saved yourself a lot of prep time and for them a lot of listening time. Yes? And by the way, fair or unfair, um, when we are judging speakers, we think the better speakers are those people who, who can cater to our right, needs as quickly as possible and not distract us with what we don't need. So you decide what content you want to convey based on your audience, yes? Now the question is, what is your overriding purpose for making this presentation? And, and I must tell you, when I talk about a presentation, I'm talking about something like what I'm doing right now, regardless of the audience size. But I also know you make presentations at meetings. There are times when you stand up to do it, and there are times when you are sitting down. But all of this is true for all of those occasions, all right? What's your overriding purpose? What do you most want to do? And how do you want that content to work for you? Take, take a step back. You've got expertise X. You know 10 things about it. But when you think about the audience and what they need and don't need, these five things are gone. So the next question is, what are you, how are you going to aim those five things at your listener? That's what choosing an overriding purpose is about. Yeah. Yeah, I know you asked us to ask a question only at the end, but it's okay. relating to, are you going to give us the notes? No, I hope you're taking notes. Okay. I am going to give you a handout okay. at the end, but take notes. I just assumed everybody was taken. It's MIT. <laughs> I assume that you take notes even in casual conversations over here, right? I'm glad you asked that question, right? And, and by the way, if you want me to recap at the end anything that may have gone by without you taking notes, just ask me, all right? So again, overriding purpose. This is a list of your choices. Only one of these can be your topmost choice. Only one. And you may think, gee, in any presentation I make, of course I'll be informing. And I'm very likely to be recommending. I hope to be persuading. I hope to be motivating. Do you see where I'm going with this? Each one of those things is easily true. But only one of them can drive your presentation. If you don't make this choice strategically, guess what's going to happen to you? You're going to put together a paper airplane, and you're going to send it out, and it will ride right, the currents and hopefully get to the point you want it to get. But you don't want a paper airplane. You want a missile. All right? And deciding upon your overriding choice is the missile. Okay? I will give you an example from my own work. I'm giving you a talk today, but often I am teaching or training. Right? And when I teach, I need to make a decision. I look at, I put together a program for a, a particular client. I look at all these. Am I informing? Yes. Recommending? Yes. Persuading? Yes. Et cetera, et cetera. But I better keep my, my eye on the fact that none of those is my overriding purpose. It's to teach. You know why? Because if I don't say it's to teach, I will end up simply informing simply recommending, right? People get a lot of knowledge, but they won't know what to do with it. They won't be directed with it. So I'm going to make this decision because it's going to determine what I say at the very beginning of any presentation, what I say in the middle, in the body, the sequence of it, and the style and tone of my delivery. Let me repeat that. Your overriding purpose determines the style and tone of your delivery, not your personality, not your mood. You need to be 
show a particular aspect of yourself to a particular audience on a particular topic with a particular purpose. And you and I need to really be able to run the range of all of those styles and, and tones. It sounds like a lot of work, doesn't it? But I'm at MIT, come on. You know, relatively speaking, this is a walk in the park. Okay, now the question is, how are you gonna sequence that message? You know, from the 10 things you know about topic X, only five will be communicated. Now you know your overriding purpose. What is the sequence of this going to be? That's what structure is all about. And structure cannot simply be logical. Logic is not enough. Structure must be strategic. There are all kinds of strategic structures, but you have to consciously and quickly choose among them. I think we have another crash here. It's very important to stay graceful under pressure. Let me know when you recapture it so I can keep talking. Okay, so let me tell you why I'm rushing through and running through this material right now. Thank you. Because this is all meant to establish and, and, and enhance your credibility from the moment you walk in the room, right? From the moment you walk in the room. Every choice that I've talked about so far and will talk about is really about you exerting control in order to maintain that credibility. So how you structure or sequence a message, well, here's what everybody knows. We talk about structure. Every presentation has an opening. Most of your material is in the so-called body of a presentation. And all presentations end. Somebody's voice stops. But too often, the voice stops at the end of the body. And this is a hugely missed opportunity. You need to provide a close which may take one minute, but it's you again taking control of what people hear and what they'll do with your information. Of all the things I'm going to talk about today, this is the most important and definitely the most important to you. The most important. After all the studies have been done and the dust has settled, how long will any listening audience listen before they are satisfied in this way, in these three ways. Every listening audience needs to be satisfied in these three areas. And they will only cut you so much slack, that is three to four minutes, to satisfy them here. All right? You must get their attention and focus it on the subject. There's many different ways to do that, but I'll give you an example from what I did a little while ago. I got your attention by talking about auditions for orchestras, right? I used that as a metaphor, and I linked what you and I do as speakers to those kinds of auditions. That was my way of getting your attention. There are many ways to do it, and there are lists that I, I have, but we don't have time to get into, of what you can do to, to make that happen. Here's the biggie, the biggie, the biggie. You must establish your credibility. This is not a moment for shyness and modesty. It's also not a moment for arrogance. That's not what I'm suggesting to you. But I am telling you that any speaker needs to convey or have conveyed his or her degree of credibility. And if you don't mind me saying it, I think it's even more important for women and for younger women. And I'll tell you why in case you haven't, mentioned, you haven't figured it out. The younger you are and the younger you look, can you, can you fill in the, the blank on that? The younger you are and the younger you look, the harder you have to work to earn respect. Right? The harder you have to work to be taken seriously. And if you've ever been passed over at a meeting, you know what I mean by that? You contribute an idea. People politely received it. 10 minutes later, 15 minutes later, somebody else puts forth 
an idea, and everybody's on the edge of their seats thinking, oh, that's brilliant. That's, that's the answer, right? That's the solution. What do you know? That's the same idea that you had, right? But the way that idea was conveyed, right, held a lot more weight and credibility. So this is why I want you really invested in this. And in that first three minutes, give them a plan. I gave you a roadmap a little while ago telling you what we're going to cover. You know why? A roadmap is a control for the audience, right? Attention getters, this is a list. You don't need to memorize it. Um, but I just want to, to assure you that there are real choices that you have for how you can get people's attention. And some will be more appropriate to certain audiences and occasions than others. And if you want more about this, I can give it to you later. Okay? When you're establishing credibility, well, here's your fantasy, of course. Maybe you don't need to establish it. Maybe the Nobel Prize winning person in your area has walked over and introduced you and said that you are the next Nobel Prize winner in that area, in which case you have nothing to do. All right? You just float in and talk. Since that's not likely to happen, I think, it's not likely to happen, the audience has to hear something about you that will make them sit up, take, no take notice, and take you seriously from the very beginning. And here's something I don't like hearing from people. Why do I have to do it from the beginning? Because when I give a presentation, by the end of it, I know they take me seriously. The problem is, that's the end of it, right? And what, how much time was wasted and how much of your energy was wasted in earning that respect from them? You want to earn it at the outset. I'll talk about how do you do that in a second. Mentioning other audiences you've had for this subject is very important, OK? If you've had other audiences, first of all. And obviously, when you mention other audiences, you want to mention impressive audiences, right? Those that will impress your listener. So let me, let me make this a little easier for you, all right? Because easier so that you don't think this is about arrogance. Let's say you're giving a presentation about topic X. And nobody, no Nobel Prize winner, nor has anyone else come in and sung your praises before you get up to speak. So you need to convey that. But you're concerned about coming off as too arrogant, right? So what you say instead is something like the following, that you're pleased to be there with this group. And you, you realize how important this topic is, because last week, when you gave this talk at Harvard, right, the audience really contributed to the ideas, and you're going to be bringing them forward. Did you hear what just happened? It, I talked at Harvard, right? You can't say that. But you embed your credentials in a larger point, right? When I'm at, uh, at organizations that have to do with investments, I will find a way to slip in the fact that last week or two weeks ago, and this will be true, I'm not lying, I was talking to the Federal Reserve Bank, to members of the Federal Reserve Bank, and their ideas were this. You heard what I just said, right? They're my client, the Federal Reserve Bank. But I'm not going to say it like that. And I want you to devise canny ways in which to insinuate your credentials into larger sentences so that people get the point about your credibility right? before you have to go any farther into it and earn it. A roadmap. I gave you one. You absolutely must if you want to be taken seriously. You absolutely must provide a roadmap within that first three to four minutes. In that roadmap, you're going to tell your audience what content you will include. And inherent in that is what content you will exclude, correct? You are controlling their expectation. You are telling them the sequence in which you will present that content. So what does that do? Once they know the sequence, you are not going to have people raising their hands and interrupting you with questions to which you have to say, 
I'm going to get to that later. I'm going to get to that later. You don't need to be interrupted. Sometimes you need to provide a rationale for the sequence. If you think you are not providing information in the order that they want, but you know it should be in a different order, you have to explain that to them at the beginning. Get them to buy the idea. Timing goals. How many of you do what I do? I live in fear when I'm sitting in an audience. Absolute fear that there is no plan about time. You know what I mean? How long is this going to go on? Right? The speaker is carried away. And that's great. But does that mean we're going to go over time? Or, right? or even beyond overtime. I mean, should I order in? Right? This is really a big deal. You need, again, to control the listener's expectations, for which you will be vastly rewarded, I tell you. Right? And you need to give a direction for the group dynamic. I did that when I said what? Take notes or write down your comments and questions, because I want to hear them in the question and answer period. What's that really another way of saying? Yes, I care about I, I care about what you have to say. Get, be be mean for a second. I'd rather you didn't interrupt. Yes, I'd rather you don't interrupt me. Right? This is a really polite way of saying don't interrupt me. But you didn't even think of that, did you? You think I just want to build in all this time to hear from you. I want you to be able to do something like that. Right? It's it's very easy to do. It, it's not duplicitous. It's not evil, is it? I don't think so. All right? And as you, as you explain the content of what you're going to be covering, make sure that for each element, you highlight the benefits to the audience. If I'm going to talk to you in my system about audience and purpose, I'm going to tell you why you're making, going to make that decision, because it will benefit you in the following way. And then we're going to talk about step two. That decision will benefit you in the following way. Do you see what I'm doing? I'm attaching a benefit to all of the elements of my roadmap. What that does is it gets the audience to sit more and more and more forward and listen, because they're now related to the information. Any benefit is about the, audi the audience's benefit. As I said, all presentations have a body. That's where everything happens. Uh, just as I said, Presentations, unfortunately, don't close. They just end at the body. Unfortunately, a lot of presentations begin in the body without those three elements that I talked about. Everybody's so eager to get to what they know. right? Those three elements of the beginning are artificial, artifice. You're putting them in there for a strategic reason, to control how people see you and take you seriously. The close. They all, they all have to close. Somebody's voice is going to stop, but you need to close. Quickly illustrate the advantages of your key points. That is the key points you've made earlier. I do not mean run through everything you said before, but say it really, 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 really fast. Okay? It's, it's the key points and those advantages. And you restate your purpose and your desired outcomes. You may have restated your purpose and those outcomes at the beginning. But if your presentation is 20 minutes long, it's 20 minutes since they've heard that. And you need to take them back to what you want them to do. This is very important for any communicator, especially for the W word. <laughs>